Good evening, everybody. So wonderful to see so many people out here tonight. And on behalf of the city of Durham, I'd like to welcome you to the public forum for the chief of police selection process. I'm Beverly Thompson, and I'm the public affairs director for the city. This is a very important part of the process, the entire selection process, which began back in January. As you're aware, we started with 42 applicants and now are down to the final two. As you're aware, we started with 42 applicants and down to the final two. So we've done a lot of work, okay? <laughs> These two candidates have undergone every step of the process, from telephone interviews to writing exercises and an intensive interview process that we call an assessment center. This process enabled the evaluators, which consisted of police chiefs and city managers from other cities and community members, to observe their interpersonal problem solving, conflict resolution, and community engagement skills. They were also questioned about their technical knowledge and their policing philosophy with respect to key issues such as leadership, use of technology, justice, officer training and development, and organizational change. Now let me tell you a little about the format tonight. Before you are the finalists. They're ready to answer any question that has come from the community so far. And tonight our goal is to present and answer as many questions as possible. Thanks to you, the community, we've received more than 65 questions. And we're ready for them to take a stab at hopefully at least 10 of them. Um, however, audience members still have a chance to submit a question. And you've been handed cards as you walked in. If you would, um, if you have a question, take a minute to write those questions, print it actually, on the cards that you were given. And a public affairs person standing there will be on the side to take it up. So feel free. Um, again, print your questions. And as they are picked up, we will look at the questions. and. As I present a question, I will read the name of the person who submitted the question, along with a Twitter name if someone submitted a question via Twitter. And that's in the interest of transparency. Okay? So candidates have not seen the questions in advance, and they will have up to two minutes to answer the question. Following this session, there will be a meet and greet opportunity for each candidate, and I'll tell you more about that a little later. I'd like to remind you, too, depending on how you process information, you may like to complete your feedback form as you listen to responses. Again, your feedback is very important to helping the city manager choose the right candidate for Durham. So let's get started. You ready? Okay. Okay. I'd like to begin the forum by giving each candidate a minute and 30 seconds to tell us a little bit about themselves and why they should be Durham's next police chief. I'll start with Ms. Sarah Lynn Davids. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. First of all, I'd like to say that it is a pleasure to be here in the city of Durham once again. Um, your city reminds me a lot of the city of Atlanta as we began to go through economic development and development and growth throughout the city where it impacted our police department to a degree where we had to change the way we think about law enforcement and how we enforce the law in our communities. As uh, most of you have read our resumes, I won't tell you everything about my experiences in the city of Atlanta Police Department, but I will tell you that 30 years of experience has afforded me the opportunity to be at a place in my career where I can offer uh, the type of leadership, the type of experience, uh, a multitude of training opportunities and initiatives that I have spearheaded in the city of Atlanta to make the city of Atlanta a greater place to live and to, um, to play and for our tourists. Um, I am uh, currently the commander of the Strategies and Special Projects Division. I started our community-oriented policing section and also our homeland security section. 
Uh, in those two particular divisions, it was very important that we as a department establish very positive relationships with our community. I believe that it is critical and it is certainly one of the most important aspects of a leader in law enforcement to ensure that there is confidence in the citizens that we serve. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am Mike Smathers, and I want to let you know what an honor it is to be sitting here in front of you. I appreciate this opportunity to speak to you and, and share my heart with you about policing and my passion for policing and the opportunity to be your chief. Uh, it honestly does my heart good to see this chamber as full as it is, full of people that are engaged and wanting to be a part of this process. And it speaks to your level of engagement and your commitment and your dedication to this fine city. As uh, Sarah had said, I won't read off my resume to you. I have a breadth and depth of experiences in Charlotte uh, that runs the spectrum of professional policing uh, and consider myself an innovator and one that is a strong proponent of community engagement and transparency that I know is so important to developing the relationships that are key to success in policing in this city. So I thank you for being here. I thank you for the opportunity, and I'm looking forward to having this conversation with you tonight. Thank you both. Now we're ready to go to the questions, and as I said earlier, you'll have two minutes each to answer each question, and we'll wrap up the questions at about 7.55 and allow both of you two minutes for closing remarks. Okay? The first question comes from the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People, and Twitter username, at A. Birch, A. Birch, okay? And they ask, what is your definition of community policing? What steps will you take to implement your philosophy? And how will you measure your success? Okay, Ms. Davis? My definition of community policing is, is more than the textbook definition. Um, community policing has been around for many, many years, and the concept of establishing relationships with the community has to be more than training our officers on what those various principles are. We have to make sure that they embrace those principles, that the relationships are sincere, and that they are sustaining relationships and that our officers understand the very specific needs and, the, and, and are empathetic to different types of communities, whether it's African American community, your Hispanic community, your LGBT community, your business community. It goes much deeper than being able to say that we checked the box, we completed the training, and there has to be certain measures. The measure is how satisfied is the community in the police department to determine whether or not community policing is effective. If you aren't satisfied, then that means that we have not been effective in our community policing initiatives. But the police department has to be proactive in s establishing those relationships. We can't just exist and expect the community to love on us. We have to do the right things. We have to ensure that we are where we're supposed to be when you have concerns and that we're there with answers and we are service oriented to make sure that you feel confident that your police department has embraced a community oriented policing concept that is beyond just the classroom. It's how we act, it's what we say, it's what we do, it's the policies and procedures that we are complying with and putting checks and balances in place, not just uh, with our officers, but with the supervisors are, that are there to ensure that the officers are fulfilling those requirements. Thank you. Mr. Smathers. Okay. I almost hesitate to use the phrase of community policing because it, it means so many different things to different people. Uh, to me, we're talking about a heartfelt commitment to be engaged and have relationships with the people that we serve. Community policing, for using that phrase, is we need to hear from you how you want us to police in your community. And we need to be responsive to that. We need to be aware of that. Uh, Sarah Lynn mentioned it. What gets measured in this line of work is what gets done. We need to have that internal expectation. Uh, we need to ensure that we evaluate the men and women of this department and how we are serving you. And we need to hear from you related to that. Uh, how we do that 
we need to hear that from you as well. Uh, I don't need to tell you how we need to come police in your community. I need to hear that back from you and hear your concerns and hear the things that are driving uh, fear that you might have or driving the crime that you're experiencing in your community. So it is a commitment. It is a heartfelt understanding that if we don't have relationship, and most of that relationship is going to be driven by transparency. And transparency is simply a means to an end to earn the trust that we have got to have from you to be successful in policing this community and providing you those police services. If we're not transparent with you, we're not going to have that relationship. And without that relationship, we are not going to make inroads and have progress related to the crime and the quality of life that we all want here in this city. Okay, I'll let you go ahead and applaud this time, but in the interest of getting in as many questions as we can, I would like to ask that you hold your applause. All right, thank you. Thank you. This next question comes from Patricia Lang, Kent Fletcher, and Dennis Stacy. They want to know what experience have you had in dealing with gangs, and do you have any solutions to gang violence that might be effective in Durham? We'll start with you. Absolutely. Um, one of my assignments, uh, one of the units that fell under my command was our gang unit. Today's gangs, uh, we, call, we sort of call them hybrid gangs. They're, they're, they, they're one name one week and then they're a different name another week. Sometimes they're girls, sometimes they're all boys, sometimes they're Hispanic gangs. What we have found that has been very, very effective is that we have to continue to educate our young people early on before they become uh, influenced by gang activity. You can't save every child, but at the same time, there has to be preventive measures. I want to add that in so that it doesn't appear that we're just enforcing uh, gang types of initiatives because we can't arrest crime away. We have to put in proactive preventive measures in our schools and also in our various uh, recreational facilities and incorporate other individuals with light concerns to try to help educate our young people to stay away from that type of activity. We use a system called NEO, uh, excuse me, um, Geo, GeoGov. No, not GeoGov. I can't think of the name of it. But it is a, a gang type of intelligence software to help us track gangs and to help us to identify those particular uh, individuals that are associated with gangs. It's almost like um, a connection type of software that uh, we go after those individuals that are actually the heads of the gangs so that we can try to intercept the type of activity from the folks that are most influential in those particular gang types of um, groups. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Smathers. I have extensive experience related to gangs, and in the 21st century, uh, there's a, a technological component to their activity and the things that they do that, that, they do that is uh, caused a, uh, a rapid shift in how we address them in law enforcement. The traditional enforcement methods, trying to keep up with them, trying to identify them, is, is practically impossible. Uh, I've got extensive experience using the gang net system that's in place in this state. Uh, to work through and identify those, those folks and take aggressive enforcement action against those that just choose not to, to go into a different lifestyle. The preventive component of that is where you're going to achieve long-term success with that. You've got to give uh, these young people opportunities to see a way other than the gang relationships that are so powerful and impactful on them. They see that as, as the family or the connection that they perhaps don't have in their life. And if we don't provide them alternatives and a way to see a different path for them, then we're going to lose some of those young people. So my heart is certainly addressing those that choose to pray and commit violence on this community. You have to be aggressive and deal with that behavior. But that doesn't need to be where your heart is and your primary resources need to be on the preventive end, on the front end, on the pipeline that deals with that and you need to be creative in how you do that by using social media and by using the various social media platforms that young people gravitate to to help spread that message and be robust in reaching out and partnering with the faith community, partnering with your school systems to have a systemic, long, entrenched method to, to deal with them. Uh, again, it is a marathon. It is not a sprint related to having impact on the gang problem and the gang activities. 
uh, and it comes from a heartfelt commitment and a partnership with uh, different service providers here in this city. All right, thank you. The next question comes from FADE, the FADE Coalition, and the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People. Racial profiling has been demonstrated statistically to be a problem in the traffic stops and searches by the Durham Police Department. What would you do to address racial disparities? Uh, I'm aware of the RTI study that just recently came out, and I'm aware of the concerns that exist in this community related to disproportionate policing in general throughout this community and how it impacts the trust and the relationship that we have with the community. We have to be willing to take a critical eye and look at how we do things. Uh, I've had training and exposure to understanding uh, racial bias and how it impacts the delivery of police services my entire career. Uh, and it's impacted me and it's made me a better police officer. So I'm a proponent of that and that has to be ongoing in the sense of it's not just a one-time snapshot where we do it and we, we indicate that we've done that. We have to have a heartfelt commitment to identifying that we all have a set of biases and life experiences that we bring into any encounter that we have with the public as police officers and the decisions that we make with the power that we're, that's entrusted to us. So we have to be willing to say it does exist. Uh, you'd be foolish to say that, and I know and recognize that there is a historical uh, fact that police officers and police departments in this country, especially in the southern part of this country, have done things that were inappropriate and illegal in minority communities. And, uh, and that's not a historical thing that is not present today. I've seen that video, just like every one of you have, of the shooting in North Charleston, where that man was just murdered. Uh, so those fears and concerns and those realities are real and they are present today. Uh, so we have to be aggressive to be committed to saying that yes, it can occur when it, is, when it does occur, that we hold ourselves fully accountable. We're transparent with you. I'm not afraid of the data. I'm not afraid of looking at the data. I'm not afraid of standing up and saying there's things that we can do better. Uh, we need to self-assess and we need to look at that data in non-traditional ways. We need to compare our own selves from shift to shift and work unit to work unit. So it's a multi-layered approach, but one that I am fully committed to as a way of doing business here in this city. Ms. Davis. Yes. Um, I share the same concerns that many um, city officials and, and uh, leaders in the law enforcement industry share as it relates to bias-based profiling. Um, it's not a good feeling um, being profiled. It's, it's not a good feeling when you are afraid that your relative is not gonna be able to drive the streets of a community that they live in without being harassed. And, and just being real about it, it's the responsibility of the department to look internally and to, on a regular basis, set up checks and balances to ensure that you don't have officers that are participating in bias-based profiling. Sometimes that action can be uh, with one, two, or three officers, and sometimes it can be with an entire unit. But when you put checks and balances in place and you're complying with the standards that your accreditation uh, status holds you to, and your, this department, the City of Atlanta Police Department, we are accredited. There are standards that we have to comply with in order to keep our accreditation. In order to do that, you should be doing internal checks on a regular, regular basis and identifying individuals who are making stops of your LGBT community, of your Hispanic community, of your um, African American community, or any other minor minority community that's not supported by data or not supported by probable cause, and to take a very close look and strong action against that type of behavior is very important because what that does, it sheds a light on the entire police department that the department is not fair to specific demographic groups. Sometimes it's just only uh, certain individuals in a police department. I would venture to say that most of the officers that wear guns and badges are good officers. It's dealing with those that are not complying with policies and procedures that make the rest of us look bad. Thank you. 
All right. Well, I'm going to follow up, and this question again is from Fade. Um, the Greensboro Police Department recently stopped all regulatory traffic stops, such as seat belts and expired tags, because of high racial disparities in those kinds of stops. It seems to be effective in reducing the racial disparities in traffic stops in Greensboro. Would either of you consider implementing such a policy here? If not, why not? Let's start with Mr. Smathers. Okay. Uh, my philosophy related to traffic enforcement is centered on in, uh, focusing on the moving violations, the driving behaviors that you're doing, the things that we all do when we drive that lead to traffic crashes, that lead to traffic fatalities. Uh, that's what we need to focus on is the behavior and the driving behavior of individuals that are unsafe. I support not having an emphasis on equipment violations. That doesn't make our community any safer. I, don't, I think it has a negligible to no effect on traffic safety as we all want it to be. And then what does it do? It does create opportunities and in, in the situations where we have, well, think about it from an equipment violation standpoint and the expenses and the, the difficulty that many have of keeping a vehicle up in operating condition and then now I'm gonna stop you because you have a minor thing wrong with your car and where's a lot of that going to occur? It's gonna occur in communities uh, that uh, might be predominantly minority or that are struggling financially and then they end up with a ticket and then what's their contact been with our officers in this department and are we safer as a result of it? We're not safer as a result of it and traffic is not safer as a result of it and our uh, relationships are fractured and it causes a level of distrust that's palpable and it's real and it's meaningful. So my emphasis will be on uh, moving violations, it will be on traffic, I support the premise of that in the sense of uh, that's not meaningful, it's not helpful to focus on the equipment. I think it's detrimental to community relationships. I think it's detrimental to the trust that we're trying to generate, and I think there's no value to it. Okay, Ms. Davis. My sentiments are very similar to, am I on? My sentiments are very similar to uh, Major Smathers. Um, in the city of Atlanta, we have consciously, uh, without uh, implementing formal um, directives to our officers sort of change the culture in that petty stops are not important to the Atlanta Police Department. Many times when petty stops are made, it leads to hostile kinds of encounters. It leads to um, uh, pulling over an individual and sometimes even an elderly individual that is just trying to get home because of a broken tail light that they probably can't get fixed. That's not what's important to us. What's important to us is dealing with violent crime issues, dealing with um, uh, property crime issues, ensuring that our officers are spending their time uh, focusing on what our main priorities are. So I would certainly be receptive to looking at how we could uh, um, sort of um, uh, accept those same types of principles as it relates to petty stops and, uh, and not enforce seat belt violations unless it's in an environment where there are other conditions that would um, have one to believe that the car is going fast and the person doesn't have a seat belt on and the child in the car isn't um, strapped in appropriately, then you've got um, safety hazards that might amount to something different. But enforcing laws that relate to just simple minor um, violations, observed violations like uh, tags uh, and, and broken taillights, those are things that I think we would certainly be looking at um, ensuring that our officers aren't spending their time in that way. Great, right, thank you. Um, we'll move ahead to another question. BJ Council asks, some communities and the Black Lives Matter movement are consistently saying that the institution of law enforcement needs to change. As law enforcement begins to make changes, what do you think the community could do to enhance the movement toward improving the relationship with law enforcement? Uh, law enforcement most assuredly does need to change and stay flexible and stay fluid. If we don't, we're behind and we're not going to be as responsive and capable as we need to be with you. So I do accept and understand that that feeling does exist. 
uh, how we do that needs to be driven by the folks in this room and by the community members here in the sense of having relationship, having dialogue from you, and having you directly tell us how you want us to perform policing services in your community. That's what needs to drive the policies, the direction, the mission, and the mandate of this department to where we're successful in doing that. I can think I know what the priority in a particular community would be. I may think I know what the drivers of crime will be, but if I'm not communicating and having that relationship and being flexible to hear that and react to that, I'm not going to be successful with you. We're not going to have the relationships and the transparency that we need. I want to talk briefly about transparency. It's a word that gets used a lot. And I can tell you, as your chief, I'm going to be blindingly transparent with you. Uh, because transparency is a means to an end, and that end is the trust that we absolutely have to have with you. So I will be transparent with you, uh, willing to self-assess and be self-critical about the way that we do business, willing to admit to you when mistakes are made because we're human beings and we do make mistakes. And when we do, we need to stand up and say that. And then we need to let you know how we plan to fix it when we do make errors. And we need to be honest and accountable to you in that way in our policies and our procedures and the internal ways that we uh, determine whether an officer's behavior was appropriate. And we need to share that information with you on a regular basis as far as the, the, the manner in which we use force, the number of times we use force, the arrest, the demographics of that arrest, and be willing to tell you that we can do better and adjust and adapt accordingly. I would, um, would yield to um, rely on the recent publication of the President's Task Force on Community Policing to establish guidelines for uh, how we build legitimacy and trust in the community. Legitimacy and trust in the community has to come from really understanding the community that you're serving. We are public servants. We are um, guardians and not warriors. And police officers in today's uh, platform of policing have to understand that we have to extend the olive branch to understand the communities in which we serve. The only way we can do that is to make a deliberate effort to sit down and meet and not just train within ourselves. We can train all day long, but if we don't train with the people who are, who are helping us to understand what the problems are and how are you being impacted, then we can't be successful. So there has to be an open dialogue especially with groups that feel that they have been uh, underserved, groups that feel that they have been harassed. I would have to have personal one-on-one -on -one interface with those individuals so that we could get down to what is the problem? What have you seen our officers doing? How can we be better servants to you? So I think it's critically important that we look at ourselves first and we examine ourselves and make sure that we provide an audience with those various groups that feel that they have been underserved. All right. Okay. This next question comes from Amanda Smith and Howard Partner. They want to know, what is your experience in de-escalating tensions in police community member community member interactions rather than using force. Are you familiar with guardian training in which officers who treat people humanely show them respect and explain their actions can improve the perceptions of officers and their department even when they're arresting someone? Ms. Davis, we'll start with you this time. Yes. Um, one of the recommendations in um, the 21st century policing um, publication talks about de-escalation of force and the de-escalation of force and how you uh, communicate to different publics in a way that we achieve a common goal. Anytime that you are in encountering uh, a community member or a citizen and there is a potential for an arrest or there's a potential for an encounter, our officers are trained in conflict resolution so that they know how to de-escalate a situation and avoid the physical contact, avoid um, 
escalating the situation to a level where it becomes a very adversarial uh, situation or where an individual may be hurt or even fatally injured. So yes, training is uh, critically important, conflict resolution training. We have what we call verbal judo, which is something very similar to uh, what you're speaking of. Verbal judo is a way of talking to an individual to keep them at a level where we can accomplish a common goal and investigate without it escalating to a physical situation. Bravado is not important in police work. And, it, and our officers across the country, sometimes the gun and the badge gives them a sense of bravado that is not necessary in certain types of situations that could be reconciled with just common courtesy, respect, and an investigative method that is very strategic and very respectful. Okay, Mr. Smathers. Preservation of life needs to be the driving goal of our interactions when we deal with people. And having that at the heart of why or what we are doing when we're dealing with people needs to impact every aspect of what we do. Talking about de-escalation and the commitment to it and giving our officers the tools to do that. Uh, and you have, again, once again, you have to be willing to teach officers, again, the guardian mindset versus the warrior mindset, that it's okay to slow a situation down. It's okay to stand there. It's okay to back up and allow a situation to diffuse itself. We don't have to always rush in and always take control and always do things. Even though we might be lawfully able to do that, it doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. That's a culture shift in law enforcement. That's difficult. Uh, that's a, a systemic effort that has to take place in your organization. And as the chief, they're the driver of that. I've got expensive personal experience in my department as being the commander of our SWAT negotiation unit, whose sole purpose was to de-escalate situations and de-escalate the tensions to allow a peaceful resolution so all those gentlemen that were behind me wouldn't have to make a tactical entry into that home, wouldn't have to use force to take that individual in crisis into custody, that we could resolve that. That works. You will save lives, <coughs> excuse me, with that emphasis. You will have lower use of force with that. And that is a commitment that needs to be, that's perpetual, that we are constantly looking and following best practices related to how to de-escalate and equipping the men and women because they're making split-second decisions in high-stress environments. So we've got to equip them that in those heated moments that they're making that decision that they feel comfortable to stop, take a breath, de-escalate, move back, as opposed to always moving forward. Okay, all righty. Uh, the next question comes from the Fade Coalition and Twitter username at Bull City and Twitter username AC Oliver A. Thorne. And they want to know, how will you assist in implementing a fair, transparent, and, and accountable police camera policy? Ms. Davis, we'll start with you. Are we speaking about body cameras? Body cameras, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, uh, city of, the city of Atlanta is um, currently going in the um, process of, of procuring body cameras. We started doing our research uh, approximately a year and a half ago on different types of body cameras and the, ex the um, experiences that other agencies we're having across the country, not just with the body cameras, with their policies and how to roll out those various policies. One, uh, one particular important aspect of that has been to make sure that we had engagement, not just from community members, but also from various uh, interest groups to weigh in on what the body camera policy should look like. So it's very important to get that level of input from legal advisors, from community members, from city officials, from legal, uh, from, your, from the city's law department as well, so that when we develop a body camera policy, it's not just a policy that serves the police department, it's one that the citizens could feel relatively confident that officers are filming so that we can have an accurate and transparent account of interactions between the community and the police department. 
Um, I believe that body cameras are going to be positive, a positive uh, aspect of policing. Uh, body cameras have a tendency to uh, make everyone pay closer attention to their behavior, the police and also the citizen. It's, called, it's what we call the Hawthorne effect. When individuals are being recorded, they have a tendency to be uh, more conscious of their behavior. Officers as it relates to policy and procedure and citizens as it relates to what the consequences will possibly be of their behavior as well. So body camera policies and transparency I believe is very important and I will be totally engaged in making sure that there is a collaborative effort in, in making sure that policy serves the city uh, accordingly. Mr. Smithers. Uh, body cameras have been fully implemented in the city of Charlotte and they are an incredible powerful tool for police accountability and accountability to the public because they're that independent capture of the events that took place and I understand that the primary driver of concern is the transparency related to that information and how do we share it with you to allow you to have the confidence that we're going to hold ourselves accountable and to give a full accounting of what took place and whatever incident is relevant. Uh, I'm a full proponent of allowing uh, an individual who considers, you know, who feels like they've been aggrieved in some way to have an opportunity to come in and, and watch that video and talk to the police department and go over that video so where they have that opportunity to see that footage and have that interaction with us uh, to look at that independent footage because it has no agenda and it has no motive other than just capturing that information. Uh, on a larger scale for the incidents, and I know the public's appetite to see a lot of this footage as you work through this, the, the statutes that exist in this state and the complexities that they create related to the desire to be transparent, but yet adhering to those statutes, which can be a very difficult and thorny issue. I'm a proponent of what I call the Boston model. The city of Boston, when they have a critical incident that's captured on a body camera, uh, they have a representative sampling, a representative group of citizens and faith members and, and community leaders that come in and they watch that camera footage and they have that in-depth discussion with the police department related to that. And then they're able to go forth and talk to their, uh, the groups that they represent and their constituencies and share with them what the police are saying is or is not accurate. The information that you're getting is or is not accurate. Uh, and at least until statutes are changed, and I do think there needs to be some statutory clarity to work through this issue because this technology seems to have eclipsed what the current laws allow us to work within, that that is a, a good interim step to thread that needle and allow you some awareness and confidence that we are not holding information back and you can have confidence in the information that we're sharing with you related to the cameras. Thank you. Uh, these next two questions are specific to your uh, respective cities. So you won't get the same question, but it has to do with uh, criticism that may have um, been, uh, may have happened in your city or to you. Uh, this question comes from Twitter username CFD356. And Chief Davis, they want to know, Atlanta has been heavily criticized for its proposed body camera policy. What did you learn from that process? What we learned from the process and the criticism really came from the RFP process, not so much from our citizens. Our citizens were involved in the development of the standard operating procedure and so on. However, um, much of the criticism came from the actual request for proposal and having individuals to be able to compete in that process. So what we did learn from that process is that the competitive process for certain types of technology is very complicated. There's so much new technology out there that it's hard to have a fair and competitive process when you're looking for certain types of features and technical equipment that only a few companies may have. Say for instance, um, a 30 second pre-buffering type of uh, feature on a body camera to the Atlanta Police Department was very, very important because what it did was that pre-buffering feature um, gives you the footage 30 seconds prior to when the officer actually activates the camera so that we are able to actually see what occurred 30 seconds leading up to, 30 seconds is a long time, to see what led up 
to that body camera being activated. That was a very important feature for us. There weren't that many uh, vendors that had uh, that capacity. And so during the RFP process, there were some very discontent uh, individuals that they weren't able to be able to bid uh, based on the scope of the work uh, that was requested. All right, thank yes. you. Thank you. Major Smathers, this question comes from username Twitter username at Meredith, Meredith Clark and Twitter username CFD356. What was your role in the department when a Charlotte Mecklenburg officer shot Jonathan Farrell? And how did your standing on the matter affect you amongst your fellow officers? I, at the time of that incident, was the commander of the Criminal Investigations Bureau. So I led that investigation into that incident. I was responsible for every aspect of it, the quality of it, and the depth of it. Uh, an incredibly difficult time for us as a department, but the facts led us and led me to believe that there was probable cause to shoot, excuse me, to uh, charge that officer for the shooting death of Mr. Farrell. Uh, and the lesson I learned from that, that accountability is difficult, it can be painful, but it's no less important that it get done. The community expects that of us. Uh, the impact on me is I lost friends in my organization. It was very difficult for our organization to accept the fact that we were charging an officer. That made it no less right, and it made it no less the thing that we needed to do at the time. I followed the information and followed the facts as we knew them to be and was comfortable with that decision. Uh, and I guess the, the thing I would like to leave with you is if that is a tangible example of my willingness to go where the information leads and the, and the facts lead, no matter how painful and no matter how difficult they are. Uh, because that was, that fractured our department, as you can well imagine. It was an unprecedented event, an event in our city to charge an officer uh, in a shooting. Uh, but and, and a lot of people disagree with me, and I'm okay with that, and I accept the fact that there's a wide spectrum of opinions on that issue. Uh, but I, as difficult as it is, I felt it was the right decision then, I feel it was the right decision now, and I would make it again, and I'm willing to make those hard decisions as your chief, because those incidents come into the life of every department. Doesn't mean that the outcome will always be the same. You pray it's not the same. You pray that any time you have to do, have to use deadly force, that it's the correct decision. But if it's not, you have to be willing to stand up and hold yourselves accountable. Okay, we're going to move on to another topic. Dennis Stacy asks, Durham's inability to maintain a full staffing level of its police force has become a critical need. What are your ideas on how to both slow the shrinkage, uh, shrinkage of our police force and recruit and retain quality police officers after we've trained them? Ms. Davis, we'll start with you. Uh, yes, uh, the city of Atlanta and other cities are having problems with um, retaining officers because nowadays um, the, the whole uh, training process and, and going through academies is basically for some officers to get uh, two or three years of experience so that they can move on to other federal entities or move on to some other agency. What we've done and instituted in the, in the City of Atlanta Police Department, it has a lot to do with budget. No, we didn't give folks raises to keep them there, but what we did do is we implemented a signing bonus for our officers, a one-time bonus that after five years, that you sign on as a contract to remain for another three years. That has worked for us. The other thing is to make your working environment one where people are proud to come to your agency every day to work in. We have officers that are proud to be Atlanta police officers. We try to create an environment where they have um, input, where they uh, can ut utilize their creativity, their uh, technological skills. We have very bright folks that come on to police agencies these days. When I came on 30 years ago, mostly everybody had a high school diploma. Having a college degree was rare. Nowadays, they have master's degrees, law degrees, PhDs, and so on. They're smart individuals. In order to uh, embrace your agency and make your officers feel that they're a part and have ownership in your agency, 
you have to utilize their creative talents. You have to put your, your uh, talent where it's most effective, allow them to express their passions in their work. Sometimes it's a matter of moving individuals off of one shift to another one so that they say that I have, I have an opportunity to advance. I'm going to stay here. They move me to a better shift. I'm not having as many family problems. It's a matter of providing those incentives that sometimes don't cost anything. It's the low-hanging fruit. Thank you. Ms. Davis. Mr. Smathers. Major turnover. Smathers. Turnover is <laughs> expensive, and it's expensive in far more than just tax dollars. It's expensive in the relationships that you lose when those experienced officers leave. It's the connection with the community that you lose when those officers leave and move on and you have to restore and renew and redo a lot of that work. So the impact is substantial and a, and a monetary cost, but I think the greater cost is in the things that you've lost when those people that know your community and that work in your community leave. You've got to be deliberate to try to incentivize folks to come work for your agency and then stay with your agency. And you need to try to incentivize that for them to live within your jurisdiction we incentivize people to live in the city of Charlotte where they work uh, through home loans and through loan forgiveness and through take home cars as uh, perks for those decisions. You're able to incentivize some people to stay and to commit to being in the city and to commit to tenure of time with you. Career development, especially with millennial officers, these young men and women coming in are highly educated. Uh, so educational benefits are tremendously valuable to them to allow them to increase their education and their skill set. Uh, it's very meaningful to them on a per personal level and it certainly makes them better police officers and able to serve you as well. They need to see a different path for them. Many of them want to change careers. Uh, I don't want them to change a career of policing. I want them to perhaps move throughout the entire police department itself and you've got to be deliberate to give them those opportunities to do that or if not, uh, even unintentionally, you'll, you'll keep an officer in an assignment perhaps that it's not suited for them or that they don't want to do. And the beauty of this profession is that it is so multifaceted that you do have those opportunities, but you've got to be deliberate to do it. The cost, as I mentioned, is prohibitive uh, financially, but it's also prohibitive related to the service that we deliver. And think about it, for every officer that you leave, the, re the recruiting, training, and academy process, you've lost that capacity for a year. So think about the capacity to fight crime and have relationships with this community when those folks leave our agency. Thank you, Major. Uh, Mr. Smathers, let's start with you on this question. It comes from an audience member. Thank you for um, submitting this question. Um, first responders do not always know how to address victims of domestic violence or sexual assault. Assault. How do you plan? How do you plan to address this problem? Uh, previously, I was the commander of the robbery and sexual assault unit in my city, so I have commanded and led, and am intimately aware of the dynamics that take place in sexual assault investigations. And we have a program in our city where we've partnered with the medical community to provide very specifically trained medical personnel to. Uh, come alongside uh, the victims of sexual assault and to participate and provide emotional support and physical support to them during what can be a very traumatic time of evidence collection in and of itself that is so vital to the case but is so difficult for a victim that has just gone through that. So you have to come alongside them with that separate professional to assist them and it, because many times they don't want to talk to that police officer right then. Uh, and you've got to be willing to adapt and adjust and give them that emotional support. We have partnered with a variety of uh, organizations within our city to provide ongoing counseling and ongoing emotional victim support to the victims of sexual assault as well. From a child sexual assault perspective, we have a very robust partnership that, al that allows forensic interviewing with, of children uh, in a way that at least minimizes the trauma of recounting uh, what they've had to go through to where we are able to capture the information that's critical for a successful prosecution of somebody that would prey on a precious child, but also minimize the damage that's done to that child as well. So police alone are not the answer to a successful sexual assault investigation. You've got to be in conjunction with those partners 
to provide that emotional support and that capacity to where they're served emotionally and physically, as well as us able to gather the vital information that we need to successfully prosecute the people that are committing these offenses. Ms. Davis? Our department has a very similar um, process and, and uh, referral groups in place that help us with these types of investigations. They're very sensitive investigations, and sometimes it's important to train your officers to just use common sense sometimes when they're doing in, uh, uh, on scene or crime scene types of investigations as it relates to uh, special victims. For example, if you have a, a, an individual, a female individual that has been raped, sometimes it's more effective to have another female there to do the interview you get more information and you may even get a, a higher level of sensitivity in that type of conversation. Sometimes officers don't know why people shut down while a child might shut down and not give the information that is required. Well, perhaps the perpetrator was uh, an individual that looked like that particular officer. Sometimes it's very important to make sure that officers are trained to use anatomical dolls with children, to utilize those skills and techniques that make sure that we can do an investigation that doesn't further traumatize that child. We have a psychological services unit in the Atlanta Police Department where our staff psychologist goes out not just to support our officers in very um, uh, difficult types of situations. They also provide the necessary on-scene support emotionally to those victims of various types of um, uh, violent crimes and um, sexual types of, of crimes. So victim witness processes are very critical and it's important to have the necessary follow-up with a victim to make sure that that victim is uh, getting the support they need during the investigation, that prosecution is uh, forthcoming, and that they are kept aware of what it is that the police department is doing in order to resolve their particular issue. Victim witness is essential in community policing as well. It's not just about taking the police report and arresting the perpetrator. It's also about establishing a long-standing relationship with an individual that happens to be a, a citizen victim. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, we have time for one final question from the audience, and this question is, what do you see as the most challenging aspect of our diverse culture in Durham, North Carolina? Ms. Davis, we'll start with you. Well, here in, in this city is very similar to the city of Atlanta, and I think one of the most challenging aspects is understanding your audience, understanding uh, what the needs, the specific and unique needs are of the different cultures that happen to uh, exist in your community. In order to do that, you have to identify liaisons and individuals who can go and effectively communicate with those particular communities, not just in your police department, but also to have those liaisons in the community to help spread the message about the police department. I think it's important that uh, along with your regular Citizens Academy, that you have Citizens Academy for your young people. Young people need to understand uh, the processes and procedures of police work. They need to understand the whys of police work, and they need to understand what their rights are as well. When, I, when you speak of a diverse community, there are different elements of a diverse community. You have an elderly community, you have Hispanics, you have LGBT. There are so many different publics in the city of Durham, very similar to major cities. And as these groups grow, the success of your police department is how deep we engage, how proactive we are in being sincere in establishing relationships and understanding how our service delivery impacts those particular groups. It can't be that we wait for people to come to us. We have to take a, 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 a sincere step in an effort to try to establish better relationships and establishing ways that we can incorporate and engage the community so that they can support us, give us information, help us to resolve crimes. But we can't do that if we don't take the step to better understand the various diversity and the different cultures that we serve on a daily basis. Thank you. Mr. Smathers. Uh, the richness of the diversity of the city of Durham 
clearly matches the city that I would be coming from, the city of Charlotte. Uh, and it's one of the things that drew me to being interested in this position. Uh, when you talk about how to effectively communicate and work with and provide policing services to that, uh, that dynamic can be ever-changing and it's critical that we have the cultural competency to understand the various needs, the various concerns of the spectrum of, of people that we, we deal with and we give services to. Uh, so we have to be very deliberate uh, to have our officers understanding that and that's an ever-changing our communities are ever-changing and so our awareness and our abilities and our training need to be. We have cultural competency, competency training in the city of Charlotte to help officers be equipped to understand how the things that they do, the things that they say, even though it might be innocent to them, could be offensive or could somehow drive a wedge between them related to that contact. That, that's an ongoing issue because uh, officers even just may not realize that the thing that they said was offensive or inappropriate to that population or to that individual or to that group. So you have to realize that that exists. You have to realize that you have to uh, be intentional to prepare the men and women of your department and equip them to where they can do that. That the expectation is that uh, they are sensitive and aware of that to where the services that we do provide to you are as professional and unbiased and appropriate as is possible to do. Okay, thank you. At this point, I'd like for each candidate to take two minutes for closing remarks. Take a deep breath. Okay. I know you've been talking, but <laughs> I'm going to start with you. Thank you, Mr. S Mr. Okay. Smithers. Uh, first again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to appear and be here in front of you. Uh, I want you to have confidence in the process that has uh, been in place for the selection of your chief. Uh, it's been rigorous, it's been arduous, it's been in-depth, and I want you to have confidence in that uh, in the sense of I want to congratulate uh, Ms. Davis uh, as for being a competitor with me in this process, and, and I want you to feel comfortable uh, in the efforts that this city has undergone to, to select your person uh, who will lead this organization for the next few years and what a critical decision I know that that is for this city. Uh, I have the skills and abilities to be your police chief. I have the breadth and depth of experiences to be your police chief. But to be really candid and honest with you, what is more meaningful to me that you take away and understand about me is the passion that I have for policing excellence. The heart that I have for transparency and the heart that I have to be engaged and have the men and women of this department be engaged with you. And not police you, but police with you and to have a relationship with you and to understand what you want from this organization so that we can uh, improve, restore the trust and the relationship that is absolutely critical and vital to being successful today. So I thank you for that opportunity. I thank you for the honor of appearing before you and I thank you for, for being here tonight. I hope I have the opportunity to meet many of you at the end of this forum and give you an opportunity to ask questions and meet my beautiful wife that's here as well. Uh, and so I look forward to that and just thank you once again. Ms. Davis. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I can also echo that you should be proud of your city government for the process that they have put in place. I'm very familiar with uh, various types of assessment centers and um, as Major Smather said, this has been a very rigorous process. They have paid very close attention to the needs of this city and to what your heart's desires are in a chief of police. I have 30 years of experience, leadership experience, and I feel that with all of the various types of opportunities that I have had in the city of Atlanta, all of the challenges that I have overcome and all of the various challenges that I continue to have to face with the city um, um, citizens and visitors, I believe that I have that acumen to lead our department here in the city of Durham and take this department to another level. We have full understanding of what the gaps have been. We have full understanding of what the needs are from the police officers because we have been exposed to them as well. So 
It's not like we haven't had an opportunity to understand the city of Durham and which direction we should go. You should be proud of this city. This is a very progressive city. We both have had opportunities apply, to apply to other agencies and other cities. There was something very attractive about the city of Durham, just looking at it from the outside. This is a place where you could easily call home. So as a candidate in this process, I am uh, pleased that I've had an opportunity to engage tonight, to be able to share with you what my aspirations are as a leader, uh, as a person that is willing to move from you know, a place that I know as home and make my home here in the city of Durham. I thank you for your attention and I too look forward to speaking to the rest of you. And I don't have a beautiful wife, I have a handsome husband <laughs> <laughs> who's sitting over there and we look forward to meeting uh, each of you. Thank you very much. Thank you both. The next step of the process will be for the city manager to review your feedback that you're going to um, hand to him tonight or hand to our, our folk taking up the um, feedback forms tonight. And he'll review all of this, all in preparation to make a job offer by the end of April with the new chief in place, hopefully by May. Also, all of the questions submitted will be given to the new chief to give them a better understanding of your concerns. Okay. The final part of tonight's agenda is the meet and greet. I know you're looking forward to that, and that's gonna give you a chance to greet each uh, candidate individually. I'm going to ask Ms. Davis to move to my left, and Mr. Smathers to proceed to the back of the room there, and receive the audience. And please remember to give your feedback forms to our public affairs people by the door so that, so that we can look at what your, your thoughts are about the candidates. Thank you so much.